call the October 13th Planning Commission meeting to order. First order of business, I'll turn it over to our legal counsel, Alex. So, um, <laughs> so the chair and vice chair are both absent from this meeting and your rules require that in the absence of both the chairperson and vice chairperson, when a quorum is present for a regular or special meeting, an interim chairperson shall be elected from those members present. So we, we, we need a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to make a motion to recognize yourself, Commissioner Haynes, as the interim chair for this meeting. That's a proper motion. We need a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. I am officially elected. Thank you so very much. Uh, first order of business is the adoption of the agenda which you have before you. Are there any questions? Otherwise, I need a motion. So moved. We've got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. You also have before you and have been sent to you previously the September 22nd minutes. Are there any questions or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, I need a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of adopting the September 22nd minutes? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we're now on to item D, recognition of council members. We have two, Council A. Van Rees. Would you like to go now or with your matter? She stepped. She stepped out. All right, Councilman Taylor. Want me somewhere else? Okay, perfect. All right, we'll get close. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all doing? Thank you so much for the work that you do. I'm here to speak on number 13, uh, 2222 SP 068001 Parthenon Avenue. Uh, we, <clears throat> I've received some, a uh, few emails, so of you in, in regards to opposition and uh, both in support. Uh, this one is okay for me, and I'll tell you why. Um, uh, currently now, uh, there's many homes over there, RM20, RM40. Uh, one of the most major complaints that I receive in that area is that uh, the, uh, the Airbnbs, the short-term rentals. And so, as you know, the council had a sunset on RM properties in regards to uh, short-term rentals. Many of those uh, actually were more or less grandfathered in uh, to it. Uh, but this is coming up, and I know that uh, one of the clauses that we put into the SP that with, that's before you in the proposal is uh, not to allow short-term rentals. And then also another piece of this is that it's, uh, if you can picture Centennial Park Dog Park, uh, it's to the east of the property. Um, and as you go west toward this property, there's uh, this property uh, that's in question, and then Metro uh, Park-owned property. So what we can do is kind of do a land swap or switch or trade, per se, uh, that I think would add great cohesiveness to Metro Park Dog Park. Uh, uh, came before you, I think, earlier, a couple of years ago, uh, to get a brand new fence at the dog park that you guys approved, so we appreciate it. So we've got a brand new fence. We have more activity, more use of that dog park. And uh, we have so many more units coming online uh, in the near future in that area. And so parks are going to be their backyard, per se, right? Centennial Park, Centennial Park Dog Park. So being able to add that cohesiveness, that opportunity for uh, an expansion or a possible expansion or parking lot or whatever it may be for Metro Parks uh, gives us an opportunity for this space. Um, uh, currently now they can build five units on the property. They're asking for 10 total units. Uh, the uh, the space um, that they can, they, they only have so much space that they can go. If they put five units on it, uh, the land coverage would be just the same as what they would do with 10 units. Uh, and again, um, I, I feel comfortable with this. Had a community meeting about it. Uh, a few neighbors showed up. We sent mail uh, and uh, we were able to have a conversation. We had a few people definitely in opposition, and, and several people reached out after the meeting uh, in support as well. Uh, just wanted to share my 10 cents. Uh, so now I've got to run. If you guys have any questions for me, I can stay. But uh, we're doing movies in the park in Elizabeth Park tonight. 
if anybody wants to join, if you guys get out of here in time. Any questions for Councilman Taylor before he sneaks out? Seeing none, thank you so much for coming. Council Lady Van Reese, would you like to go now or with your item? Very good. One quick order of business. If I could ask everybody to silence their phones, that would be very helpful. Fantastic. All right, we are now on to item E, items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa? The following, oh God, that's loud. <laughs> the following items are for deferral or withdrawal on page three of your agenda, item number one, 2021S, 122-001, resubdivision of lot 18, Sharondale Heights. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item 2A, 2022-CP-003002, Bordeaux-Watts Creek Haines Trinity Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th Planning Commission meeting. And I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. The associated case on item four, 2022 SP 043001, 633 West Green Lane SP. Staff recommendation. Is there another mic on besides mine? Just feedback. Um, Number item 2B, 2022 SP 043001, 633 West Green Lane SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. And I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number three, 2022 SP 049001, 15th and Church. Uh, staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th Planning Commission meeting. Item number four, 2022 SP 064001, TriStar Centennial Medical Center, Bellevue. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th Planning Commission meeting. And I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number five, 2018 SP 064002, Cubby Holes SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th Planning Commission meeting. Item number six, 2022 SP 040001, 2631 and 2635 Gallatin Avenue Dog Daycare. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th. 27th Planning Commission meeting. On page five of your agenda, item number seven, 2022S221001, Hawks Haven. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th Planning Commission meeting. On page six of your agenda, item number 11, 2022SP055001, Staff recommendation, Bellevue Townhomes. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. On page seven of your agenda, item number 16, 2022Z081PR001, a rezoning on Ezell Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 10th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 17, 2022Z082PR001, a rezoning on Spencer Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 27th Planning Commission meeting. All right, Lisa, let me read these back to you, make sure we've got these correct. Item one, two A, two B, three, four, five, six, seven, eleven, sixteen, and seventeen. Yes. Commissioners, you've got a motion for deferral withdrawal on those items. I need a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we're now on to item F, the consent agenda. Lisa? As, uh, as noticed to the, um, as noticed to our public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I'm now going to read the item number and the name of the items that are on tentative consent. If there is anyone here in opposition, please raise your hand. If, if there is opposition, then the item will be presented in the order in which it appears on the agenda. 
Item number eight, 2007 SP 048001, Zion Hill SP amendment. Is there anyone here in opposition to item number eight? Item eight will be on consent. Item number nine, 2021 SP 091001, Pinhook Ridge. Is there anyone in opposition to item number nine? Nine will be on consent. Item number 10, 2022 SP 046001, Walton Station. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 10? 10 will be on consent. Item number 12, 2022 SP 067001, Edwin Greens Phase 2. Is there anyone here in opposition to item number 12? 12 will be on consent. Item number 13, 2022 SP 068001, Parthenon Avenue SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item 13? They're in the hallway. That one will be pulled off of consent. Item number 14, 2022 SP 072001, 2830 Gallatin Pike SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item 14? There's opposition to 14. 14 will be presented. Item number 15, 2022 SP 06101, 1603 and 1605 Hampton Street. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 15? 15 will be on consent. Item number 18, 2022Z091PR001, a rezoning on East Trinity Lane. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 18? 18 will be on consent. Item 19, 2022Z096PR001, a rezoning on Nolansville Pike. Is there anyone in opposition to item 19? 19 will be on consent. Item 20, 2022Z100PR001, a rezoning on East Moreland Street. Is there anyone in opposition to item 20? 20 will be on consent. Item 21, 2022Z0, I'm sorry, 2022Z101PR001, a rezoning on Whites Creek Pike. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 21? 21 is on consent. 22 will be presented. Item number 23, 2022Z104PR001, a rezoning on East Trinity Lane. Is there anyone here in opposition to item number 23? 23 will be on consent. Item 24, 2022Z111PR001, a rezoning on Atrium Way. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 24? 24 will be on consent. Item 25, 2013 UD002039, Murfreesboro Pike UDO. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 25? 25 will be on consent. Item number 26, 2022S184001, Charlotte West Side Subdivision. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 26? 26 will be on consent. Item number 27, 2022S211001, Lot 41 map of Kenmore Place. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 27? 27 will be on consent. Item 28, 2022S241001, Parkwood Estates. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 28? 28 will be on consent. And item number 29, 2022S242001, resubdivision lot one on plan of resubdivision of EA Clifton land. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 29? 29 will be on consent. I'm gonna now uh, read through with the captions and recommendations. Bear with me, this will take a moment. The. Um, as, if for, as information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number eight, 
2007-SP-048001, Zion Hill SP Amendment. It's a request to amend a specific plan on property located on Buena Vista Pike. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, it's a request to amend a specific plan on property located on Buena Vista Pike, uh, zoned SP to permit 55 multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number nine, 2021 SP 091001, Penhook Ridge. It's a request to rezone from AR2A to SP for property located on Penhook Road to permit 39 single family residential lots. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions, and I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 10, 2022 SP 046001, Walton Station. It's a request to rezone from RS10 to SP for property located on Walton Lane to permit 217 residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page six of your agenda, item number 12, 2022 SP067001, Edwin Greens, phase two. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to SP for property located on Edwin Street to permit 49 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 15, 2022 SP061001, 1603 and 1605 Hampton Street, SP. It's a request to rezone from CL to SP for property located on Hampton Street to permit up to 60 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. And I would like to note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. On page seven of your agenda, item number 18, 2022Z091PR001, a request to rezone from RS10 to R10 for property located at 515 East Trinity Lane. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 19, 2022Z096PR001, a request to rezone from SP to MULA zoning for property located on Nolansville Pike. Staff recommendation is to disapprove MULA and recommend approval of MULANS. Item number 20, 2022Z100PR001, a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on East Moreland Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions, and I would note that Commissioner Blackshear is recusing herself from that item. Item number 21, 2022Z101PR001. It's a request to rezone from R8 to RMANS for property located on Whites Creek Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page eight of your agenda, item number 23, 2022Z104PR001. It's a request to rezone from OL and RS10 to RM20ANS for property located on East Trinity Lane. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 24, 2022Z111PR001. It's a request to rezone from CS to MUL for property located on Atrium Way. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 25, 2013 UD 002039, Murfreesboro Pike UDO. It's a request for modification to a UDO. Uh, to modify the front yard setback and minimum facade width requirements for property located on Morris Gentry Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve minor modification of facade width along Morris Gentry Boulevard and a major modification to the front yard setback from Morris Gentry Boulevard with conditions. Item number 26, 2022S 184001, Charlotte Westside Subdivision. It's a request for final plat approval to create eight lots on property located on Charlotte Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. On page nine of your agenda, item number 27, 2022S, 211001, lot 41, map of Kenmore Place. It's a request for final plat approval to shift lots on properties located on McGavick Pike and Kenmore Place. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and find lots one and two provide for harmonious development. Item number 28, 2022S, 241001, Parkwood Estates. It's a request for final plat approval to remove the reserve parcel status on property located on Stockdale Lane. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions including an exception to the double frontage standards of the subdivision regulations. 
Item number 29-2022-S-242-001. It's a resubdivision of lot one on plan of resubdivision of EA Clifton land. It's a request for final plat approval to create one lot on property located on Watts Creek Pike and a portion of uh, I'm sorry, on property located on Watts Creek Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions including a variance from sections 4-25A1A, 4-25A1B, and 4-25A1C of the Metro Subdivision Regulations. And then under other business, item number 30, employee contract amendment for Diana Tomlin and Abby Rickoff, employee contract renewal 31, employee contract renewal for Jason Swagger. Item 32, new employee contract for Austin Fernandez and Josie Rabari. Um, item 33, adoption of the 2023 Planning Commission calendar, which I have included a copy of on your desks. And item 37, to accept the director's report. All right, that was a long list. Let me make sure I get this right. Items for consent are as follows. 8, 9, 10, 12, 15, 18, 19, 20, 21, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, and 37. Commissioners, you've heard the items before you for consent. <laughs> Any questions? Otherwise, I need a motion. We approve the consent agenda. Second. That's a proper motion and a proper second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, that means if I am correct, Lisa, we will hear items 13, 14, and 22. Is that correct? That's correct, and I also wanted to note that we had deferred items to both the October 27th and November 10th meetings, and both of those meetings will take place here as opposed to our regular location due to voting, so I did want to just state that. Perfect. All right, we will start with item 13 with the presentation from the staff. Chair, let's um, let's go to 14. Okay, we're going to start with item 14. And that's Jason. Jason, we're Jason. going to start with you. Hold on, just a second, Chair. I'm hearing that item 14 was the applicant acknowledging that he was here, not that he was in opposition, so we can actually put that one back on consent. Fantastic. So if it's okay with the commissioners, can we add item number 14 to the consent agenda? I need a motion. There's a motion. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 14 is now approved via the consent agenda. So that means we're going to hear items 13 and 22. That's, Lisa? Correct. That's correct. And I need to unlock the computer. So okay. I'm going to do that. Lisa, you're wearing many hats today. <laughs>
it, it locked again, please. Oh, just hit escape. Um, Chair, I understand that there is still conversation in the hallway regarding item 13, so if we can just go to item 22. Uh, well, my reviewer is not in the room. Amelia, who needs to present the item, is not in the room. So. Okay. Great. We will go to item 22. Y'all are keeping me on my toes today. Apologies. All right. Item number 22. Just talk loud. All right. Um, this is Abby Rickoff, and I am presenting item number 22, uh, case number 2022Z103 PR001. This is a request to rezone a portion of property located at 1019 Thomas Avenue from R6, one and two family residential to mixed use limited alternative, so MULA zoning. Um, the site is located west of Gallatin Pike. Staff recommendation is to disapprove. The property is um, located on 0.35 total acres and is located on the north side of Thomas Avenue, west of Gallatin. The portion of the property that is proposed to be rezoned um, it consists of 0.06 acres and it's the portion that's outlined in red on your screen. The remainder of the property is approximately 0.29 acres and is um, outlined in orange for reference, but that portion is not included in the rezone request. The site is located at the eastern edge of residential uses that have developed on both sides of Thomas Avenue, um, characterized by primarily single and two-family residential uses. Um, and this development pattern is similar if you move towards the internal streets to the north and south. Um, the site is also located directly west of properties that front Gallatin Pike, where non-residential uses line the corridor. Um, one of the adjacent properties is located at Thomas Avenue and Gallatin Pike, where an existing commercial development wraps the corner but is oriented towards um, Gallatin Pike. And then an unimproved parking lot is behind this property, um, and so it runs, uh, it runs, it spans the boundary with the portion that is proposed to be rezoned at this site. You'll note that the zoning boundaries are um, fairly defined between the corridor and then the residential uses to the interior um, that line Thomas and then the surrounding residential streets. So this site is located on the edge of a neighborhood maintenance policy area where surrounding properties have developed with residential uses characterized by moderate to high density patterns, um, which is what you would expect in an urban an urban residential neighborhood. Um, the property is located on the seam of a T4 neighborhood maintenance policy area present along Thomas um, and a higher intensity policy area, so the T4 um, CC urban community center policy, which is prevalent along both sides of Gallatin Pike. Um, the T4CC policy supports mixed-use development that is expected along corridors um, where development, where the development character would include those non-residential and mixed-use, um, mixed uses to meet the intent so to serve the needs of the neighborhood. The portion of the site that's proposed for MULA zoning is at the northeast corner of the R6 zoning district of an R6 zoned property um, and the T4 neighborhood maintenance policy area behind properties that have developed with non-residential uses that front the corridor. Uh, the dividing line, the dividing policy line is intended to separate the non-residential uses president present along Gallatin um, from the interior residential neighborhood. While the MULA zoning request includes a small area of the overall property uh, located nearest the northeast corner adjacent to um, existing MULA zoning to the east, um, staff does not find application of MULA to be in keeping with the intent of the T4 neighborhood maintenance policy area where non-residential zoning districts are not supported. Therefore, our recommendation is to disapprove. Um, 
just want to make sure. So it's just that little red spot we're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. Is the applicant here? There he is. All right, you will have 10 minutes. You're welcome to save two minutes for rebuttal. Please state your name and proceed. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Commissioner Haynes, and good evening, Planning Commissioners. Uh, my name is Scott Morton with Smith G Studio, and my address is 1005 North 14th Street in East Nashville. Uh, and Commissioner, if I could kindly request to reserve two minutes for a potential rebuttal, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, so I I've, have I've to be honest, I find myself in an unusual position. Um, for the first time before this commission in presenting a case with a recommendation of disapproval by staff. I um, guess there's always a time for a first, um, but I think I do have some facts on this particular un unique case that will help give more clarity and uh, provide more details to for you to consider. Um, <clears throat> I understand staff's rationale to disapprove the request due to the existing policy of the .06 acre site. And based on reviewing the policy language, I believe the commission and the policy may consider unique circumstances and context, uh, which I'll go into greater detail shortly. The policy recommends supporting non-traditional zoning options when a request brings a site closer to conformance with the land use policy in place. The main development site along Gallatin Pike for the proposed mixed-use building is currently zoned MULA. MULA zoning requires that parking lots shall only be permitted to the side and rear of proposed buildings. Uh, the current width of the MULA site for the new mixed-use building does not allow enough room to provide adequate parking to meet Metro standards in the rear of the building. Therefore, the request before you simply proposes rezoning a small sliver of property at the rear of the site to accommodate an adequate parking area consistent with the MULA regulations. We believe the rezoning request will bring the project closer to conformance to the land use policy objectives by relocating the parking to the rear and activating the Gallatin Street frontage. To give you some additional context, the developer of the proposed mixed-use building along Gallatin owns both the main development site fronting Gallatin and the adjacent R6 residential lot facing Thomas Avenue. The site is currently surrounded both on the east and the south sides by MULA zoning, and the rezoning of this small sliver would align the rear property lines of the MULA property next door on the corner and make that a consistent edge along um, that rear property boundary. As for the impact to the adjacent R6 property to the west, because the developer also owns this lot that is directly affected by this change, this eliminates the impact to the neighborhood maintenance policy area at this particular location. Additionally, the rezoning of this small parcel would maintain a legal developable lot for future residential development on the Thomas Avenue uh, parcel and provide ample room for a landscape buffer between the proposed parking lot use and res future residential building. We believe the policy does in fact support the rezoning of this 0.06 acre property from R6 to MULA when all of this context is taken into account and to review the policy justification, one, both the existing zoning and the community land use policy requires or recommends parking to be located in the rear of the property. The policy furthermore recommends that the ground floor of the proposed development promote active uses at the pedestrian level with shallow setbacks built to the sidewalk, framing the street, and creating an active sidewalk and public realm. The proposed development plan will eliminate the non-conforming existing front parking area and its associate, associated curb cut that's across the entire street frontage uh, along Gallatin Pike, bringing the project into conformance with the land use policy and community vision for a walkable, vibrant, uh, 
project on Gallatin Road. The new streetscape along Gallatin Road will incorporate new planting strips, uh, street trees, a new 10-foot sidewalk, and a new public plaza space in front of the building activating this public space. Two, the policy states that mixed-use buildings may serve as a transition to adjoining policy areas. Thoughtful attention should be given to the placement and orientation of buildings within these edges as they relate to their surroundings. Implementation through rezoning occurs as proposals are judged on their merits and ability to meet the goals of the community plan. Three, a site's location in relation to centers and quarters shall be weighed when considering which zoning districts would be appropriate in a given situation. The size of the site, environmental conditions on or near the site, and the character of adjacent transect and policy areas shall be considered. Another factor that will be considered is whether there is potential to redevelop sites that are not consistent with T4 community center policy in a manner that brings them closer to conforming to the policy. These situations may warrant the use of zoning districts that the policy might otherwise consider inappropriate. In closing, we believe the unique conditions of the site and the context-sensitive design solutions provided for a rezone, this rezoning application is consistent with the policies, goals, and objectives of the East Nashville Community Plan. We believe the rezoning request will bring the project closer to conformance to the land use policy and greatly benefit the community. We kindly request that you support our rezoning request and we will remain available to answer any questions you may have. Um, as always, we thank you very much for your time and consideration in this matter. Thank you so much. You will have two minutes for rebuttal. We will now open this meeting up for the public. Uh, to remind everyone, you'll be given two minutes. Please state your name and address. We will start with the people in support of this rezoning request. Are there any here? Anybody in opposition to the zoning request? Please come on up. Please state your name and address. Hello, my name is Lane Weber. I live at 923 Thomas Avenue, Unit B, 37216. I'm here speaking in opposition of case 2022Z103PR001. Uh, while the local community may be unable to prevent development that in itself will be detrimental to the area, many residents that I've spoken to in the East Hill neighborhood are opposed to this rezoning that will cause traffic and safety problems, destroy local wildlife habitat, and potentially lower the property values of the existing community. Traffic and safety of pedestrians are major areas of concern. The rezoning of this parcel will make traffic worse than ever before. The local neighborhood traffic will disproportionately surge during morning and evening rush hours, causing traffic issues during critical times. The traffic surge during morning rush hours will also negatively impact safety for children since students walk to the bus stop at the end of the street. Secondly, wildlife has been observed in the area um, by myself. I've greatly appreciated that. Um, and any further development will destroy that habitat. Um, any planned development of the property should consider the continuing impact of local wildlife habitat. Um, property values are likely to go down in the surrounding areas if commercial offices are developed. Um, offices are very inconsistent with the neighborhood already developed in the neighborhood, or in the area, excuse me. Finally, I urge you to disapprove of the, this proposed rezoning and from recent meetings and discussions with my neighbors, I know my opinions are shared by many who have not been able to attend today's meeting or write emails. Uh, I thank you for your time and continued service. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else in the audience wish, wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, you have two minutes for rebuttal.
Uh, yes, I, I understand Mr. Weber's concerns, and we had a, a nice phone call earlier this week um, discussing the project and giving more information about the details. I've also received several calls from area residents, including the adjacent homeowner uh, on the other side of this lot, uh, wanting more information about the rezoning case. And when learning about the request was only impacting the rear corner, we're supportive of that change, knowing that this wasn't changing the residential condition of, uh, you know, 95% of the, the residential lot that's there in place uh, would remain R6 and would be developed in the future as a residential property. Um, furthermore, this, this particular request for the parking, um, we, the project for the mixed-use development is for a small office tenant, and we want to bring the project into conformance with the policy and activate uh, this street with a great project, a building, and good tenants for office tenants. This will be a small office. Um, it's a very small scale. It's a very small lot. It's 40 feet wide. Uh, we will be making these improvements to the property. We attempted to do this through the BZA, working with the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals. However, given that this commercial uh, parking is, in fact, a land use designated in the zoning code, uh, the BZA was unable to grant a, an exception in this, in this particular circumstance because it is a change in land use. And therefore, the only vehicle to allow the parking in the rear would be to request a rezoning uh, in these circumstances. So um, again, happy to answer any questions you may have regarding our exhibits that we've provided as well, trying to outline um, what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I will declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Blackshire, we will start with you. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, well, it was, I think the uh, applicant's presentation was really helpful, and I also appreciate the neighbor coming by and um, voicing his concerns. So obviously we see this a lot, not this exact situation. This is pretty unique, but a situation in which you have um, a zoning request where the underlying policy perhaps is in conflict, and sometimes that's addressed by a policy change for the portion of affected um, land. Was that ever something that was discussed? Internally, I think we did have discussions about it, but um, Given the depth of what was already existing there for the policy, mm -hmm. we staff um, didn't push in that direction. Um, in considering sort of what's going on along the corridors like that, um, we try not to let things creep too far into the neighborhood in regards to policy or zoning, either one. Um, and so it, that is a possibility. They did not, they haven't applied for a policy amendment, but I, I don't know that. Um, that we necessarily push them in that direction. Gotcha. Would this be, um, this is a hypothetical, um, would this be something that could be looked upon favorably by staff if it was presented like an SP or? It, it's not, so I mean, just the use of parking for commercial uses is not supported in residential zoning districts, um, which are only, which are the only districts that would be supported generally by a neighborhood maintenance policy. Gotcha. And so we would still see that sort of rezoning as being um, inconsistent with the, the goals of the neighborhood maintenance policy. Gotcha. And so um, it was an interesting point that the applicant raised about trying to bring parts of um, the existing, I guess, commercial use property in conformance by moving the parking to the rear, which would be a th probably an optimal thing from everyone's perspective. Um, but it sounds like just because the policy, um, the residential policy is in place, there's just no room from staff's perspective to allow that commercial use on that portion of the property. 
So we certainly encourage parking when present um, and required to be located in the rear. Um, I would note that on Gallatin Pike, actually parking would not be required in this location. Um, per the zoning code, um, there was a text amendment earlier this year, I want to say, that um, exempted parking requirements for um, properties that are located along a, um, a uh, immediate need a multimodal corridor. Sorry, a long range or immediate need a multimodal corridor. So I don't believe that parking would necessarily be required. Gotcha. So, so yes, we would, if parking is provided and required, we certainly want it behind buildings. I got you. Um, well, I mean, these things, these types of requests for me typically are pretty easy because um, if the policy doesn't allow it, then um, the policy doesn't allow it. And that, that would be our purview as um, a planning body would be to follow policy. I do think that the applicant's um, presentation was really persuasive about just the practical effects of this little bitty portion of um, land being allowed to be rezoned to MULA. Um, I'm not sure, just looking at the underlying residential policy, how you get there, um, but I do think that the development is sound. I do hear what the neighbor is saying about just traffic and just adding um, commercial uses, introducing maybe um, bothersome commercial uses into that area. So I certainly hear what the neighbor is saying on that. I probably would still um, be in favor of staff's recommendation, but I, I certainly think that the applicant made a compelling case for why this would be appropriate for the area. And I'm interested to hear other commissioners. Thank you. Councilman Allen. Thank you. Um, Appreciate both speakers showing showing both sides. Um, one question I have for the applicant, if I may, is 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 this the only configuration possible? Would it would it necessarily require the entire lot be covered by the building, um, as opposed to putting the parking on the on the rest of the lot and making it a two story building, for example, or a smaller building? Sure. No, it's excellent question, uh, Council Lady. The the lot width is around 40 feet wide, and so we looked at bending the parking into the site in a in a 90 degree. Um, uh, position, however, there's not enough physical width for uh, to meet a full parking requirement and the landscape buffer in the north. So we wouldn't be able to provide a drive aisle or even one side of parking, much less two sides of parking. So it physically would not work in that configuration. Is what uh, led us to the design solution that's presented before you. Okay. So when you say drive aisle, you mean the the area that you drive in, and then having the parking spaces parallel. That takes more than 40 feet to do that. Correct. So the metro standard is 18 feet of parking stall and a 24-foot pavement, which would be 42 feet total, and we only have 30 feet available for us. Gotcha. Okay. That's uh, that's important. Um, I would echo the sentiments of, of Commissioner Blackshear in that um, what what we do is is compare things to policy. Um, I, would, I would wonder if the consideration might be made to come back and request to change the policy so that so that takes the takes us out of the hot seat um, and that may that may be one thing with it that would be considered just to, to try to make at least make that part easier for us that doesn't address neighbors concerns about traffic um, but I appreciate the efforts to get the parking off the street and to make the, the Gallatin Pike a more walkable place so I will listen to my wise colleague to my left and see what he says. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and thanks to my thanks to the applicant, thanks to the neighbor that came out. Um, uh, I believe that the applicant has made a really compelling case for some unique circumstances for this parcel. Um, what I will share, I live a little bit uh, closer to Eastland, but I myself live four doors off of Gallatin and have lived there for. Uh, going on 20 years now and know that uh, the East Nashville community has been trying to eliminate blight uh, on Gallatin for a generation, maybe a couple of generations now. And um, there have been a number of uh, challenges to that. 
Um, one of those challenges is right uh, at the corner adjacent to this, we have what our community has considered to be an adverse use. So Gallatin used to be primarily dominated, number one, by automobile uses, which the present use is, but also pawn shops, uh, check cashing businesses, a number of things. Um, then Councilmember Mike Jamison had worked with um, planning and the community on an improvement plan for uh, for Gallatin that at that time uh, would have limited some of those uh, alternative financial services uses um, as well as it would have at that time required uh, that all buildings be built to the street. Uh, which is now pretty typical in the A zoning districts that ended up being challenged in court um, and uh, that uh, use of a specific plan was not considered to be specific enough to a parcel and that was thrown out. And so not only did we sort of go back to the drawing board uh, for some of the adverse uses that have dominated Gallatin, but uh, I believe that another, uh, there's an, an alternative Gallatin Road plan uh, urban design overlay that ironically makes even the building placement specifications of A zoning districts optional. And so in a few cases, what we've had um, are buildings that despite the A zoning districts um, can still build um, parking that faces Gallatin. We actually ironically have had someone who opted to build on a huge parcel, which could have been dense multi mixed use development. They opted to build a um, automobile convenience use that completely turns its back onto Gallatin. It is built to the sidewalk, but that is a completely blank wall. Uh, and then you have an actual gas station and convenience market in the interior of the neighborhood that faces the interior of the neighborhood with its back wall to Gallatin, which is pretty bizarre. Um, so we have been kind of struggling to make Gallatin a walkable, pleasant, uh, safe environment in a number of levels for at least 20 years that I know of, and uh, we've had a number of challenges. I feel like this plan uh, actually addresses those challenges very well by saying that um, they would, number one, redeveloped a site with something that actually does address the street, which according to the Gallatin Road EDR, they're not required to do, but they are planning to do that. Uh, it does use an existing, what appears to be an existing access easement to, to locate a little bit of parking in the rear, um, which is typically recommended. You would not typically today recommend that someone have a curb cut uh, on an arterial, right? So this does what uh, planning along Gallatin and other corridors has promoted for a long time, which is that you actually, if you do have parking access, that it be off of the side street. That's been a, a, a policy recommendation for a long time, and this plan accomplishes that through the use of an access easement. I also feel uh, sympathy for, for neighbors in this area when I review the um, the uh, metro maps, what you uh, what you see reflected in the metro maps, even where the, the person who spoke uh, resides, is that you've had pretty wholesale demolition of houses back in these streets um, in, in terms of the idea of speaking to pr preservation of neighborhood character and lack of traffic and wildlife habitat. When you look at the, the the use back in those streets, very widespread demolition of nearly every house in those neighborhoods that were replaced with horizontal property regime duplexes with front yard parking access. And that's the residential that's that's gone in. So most of the traffic on the street is actually because of the intensification of redevelopment in ways that were not really urban. And that's what's happened. And I mean, I empathize with the neighbor for that, but, but I do not feel that relocating a very small amount of parking to the rear of this, uh, this proposal um, affects that in any, in any meaningful way. We also see that this uh, area that just described as habitat, um, I believe all currently, pretty much all, ha at least from the street, uh, has commercial entitlements anyway. So uh, all that is to say that um, it, it, 
the Trinity Lane area today actually is turning into another one of these kind of really walkable neighborhood center areas. You've got uh, Nicoletto's, you've got uh, a couple of bars and restaurants, you've got some retail. You have some things that are emerging right here at, particularly at Trinity and Gallatin that our community has been waiting for for 20 years. And it's great to see it. It looks like this plan will further that community goal overall, and it will do so in a way that does provide parking, but it provides it in a much more appropriate location than in than off of the front curb cut off of Gallatin, which they can still do within that overlay. So I feel like this, this site plan presents a good plan. It utilizes an existing um, access easement in a way that is appropriate, that the access easement would be there either way. So we're just looking at can they line it on both sides with a, a few parking stalls or not. I think that's appropriate. Uh, and I find, and would, would want to persuade my colleagues, but uh, I look forward to your comments, that uh, and looking at a slightly bigger picture for the East Nashville Community Plan, as Mr. Morton has described very well, that, that this proposal actually meets the overall East Nashville Community Plan better than, um, than what some of the existing options are. So I'm generally favorable to this plan, but look forward to hearing what my colleagues would say. Thank you, Councilman. Commissioner Clinton? Well, it's uh, truly an interesting one. Um, as everyone has said, it's a compelling case. Uh, and frankly, although I didn't originally think I was going here, uh, it's compelling enough for me to be for it. <laughs> I am particularly persuaded by by your comments, Councilman Withers. Um, I, I understand we don't want to just go against policy. I know that that's not a great thing. Shouldn't happen very often. I think this has been a very well-made case, very well explained by by the uh, proponent. So I intend to support it. Mr. Henley. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, actually, you know, when I when I saw this in our in our packets, you know, I was like, I got to go <laughs> look at this because this is a very unique little sliver of property um, asking for for rezoning. Um, but after doing that, I understand it, and I and I do agree uh, with the sentiment of, of my fellow of my fellow um, uh, you know the council member especially, but also my, my fellow board members. I think it was. Something that first came to my my brain, but then it was addressed in the question that was asked, which was, you know, why isn't this uh, at, at BZA and, and requesting, you know, some augmentations to the buffer, um, but but in the sense of you know creativity, but also I think responsibility. It's you know it's addressing that on property owned by the applicant versus encroachment of of property owners next to it, and that that kind of that kind of shifted it for me a, a little bit. Um, I do think that. Um, um, you know, one of the greatest things we can do for our city is to, on, on all of our major corridors, is to start to eliminate some of the shallow, small parking lots. I think they're extremely dangerous, um, even now on vehicular-dominated streets. But as we encourage, um, you know, bicyclists, as we encourage more pedestrian traffic, I mean, they're, those are going to cause harm um, to people. And I think this is, you know, a project that not only eliminates that, but also um, is proposing activating um, those areas. And so, you know, the scale of this project is one that just kind of really hits home with me. I, I love the scale of the project. Um, I do think that what was presented here was 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 very compelling, and also just utilizing the the easement that's already there. Um, you know, it, it currently after driving the area, um, you know, it's 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 pretty much paved. I think if you didn't do it, people would park there anyway. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's probably how it would function if 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 we didn't do this. Um, and you know, just understanding where that entry point is. I mean, it, it, it does not bring traffic into the neighborhood. I mean, you're pretty much entering right on the backside of a commercial parcel. Um, so, you know, signs is saying, you know, have it have this facility operate without parking. And I know we've had a few conversations recently about, you know, areas where parking's not required. What is the right amount and should it should it be required? I do think it's a it's a strong solution that is that is completely contained by the owner and the applicant and, and, and carrying that burden. So I'm I'm in to support as well. Commissioner Tibbs? Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, following along with um, my um, 
recent com recent <laughs> commissioners, but um, I guess that's a good way to say yeah. it, right? But um, <laughs> one of the things is, um, you know, one of the highlighted parts about it would this air, would not meet the minimum of lot size requirement for residential development anyway, like by itself. So I think that's one thing to think about. I think that um, it actually probably makes the R6 um, a little bit even easier to develop without having a little dog leg. And then um, kind of what uh, uh, Councilman Withers brought up, it actually does make the uh, proposed mixed-use building more, uh, I'll just say compliant, but maybe uh, this is a word that we'll use for now <laughs> on Gallatin Pike, so maybe it can even um, uh, be a catalyst for uh, something similar to that, not trying to have parking on the front. Um, and yeah, I think it's actually I think it makes the uh, the whole solution better uh, than trying to keep it at R six. Honestly, uh, I, I think that um, I actually, I, you know, I know that this does encroach as far as the policy is concerned, but not you know we're actually maybe not as so much as fact when it's probably more contiguous M U L A anyway. So a lot of better things than what I said have already been said. So with that, I'll make a motion. Um, how do I say that now? Uh, I can't say the motion to a motion to I'll just say a motion to approve uh, this uh, rezoning request. Lisa, you have a, you have your hand up. If I may make a suggestion, um, if you were um, if you were going to recommend approval of the request, then I would suggest that you also direct staff to prepare a housekeeping amendment of the um, land use policy so that we don't have a situation. The, the, the rules speak to your review against policy, um, but does allow you to direct us to consider housekeeping amendments in, in, in such cases as this. And so I would suggest that it be, that that be included as part of the motion. Thank you. So the housekeeping amendment would be, is that to change the underlying policy? What is, okay. Okay. Well, I mean. For, for that portion. For that portion, yeah. Well, I think for me that was the issue, just that the policy would be incongruent with the land use. So with that, I think I would be in favor. Thanks for clarifying. Mr. Jeffrey, back to you. Yeah, let's see if I can. I won't be able to say that as, as eloquently as Lisa said, but I'll just say I make a motion to approve, and I would direct a staff to do a housekeeping um, amendment. <laughs> For clarification. <laughs> <laughs> to extend the mixed-use quarter policy onto this portion. To extend the mixed-use policy on this quarter. That is, that is a proper motion. <laughs> I need a second. second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we are now going back in order to item number 13. Amelia? Yes. Okay. Lisa, you need hazard pay. You do. <laughs> yeah. Sure. While you're standing up there, do you want to just sing and dance?
Okay. It's this one? Okay. Sorry, everyone. Okay. My name is Amelia Lewis, and I will be presenting item 13 tonight, which is 2022 SP 068001 Parthenon Avenue SP. Uh, the request is to rezone um, 2 SP to permit 10 multifamily units. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Uh, the existing zoning on the site is RM20 and the proposed zoning is again SP. Um, the site is about a quarter of an acre located on the north side of Parthenon Avenue, um, east of the intersection of Omen Street and Parthenon Avenue. Um, the parcels are currently owned by Metro Parks and are undeveloped. Uh, to the northeast of the site, um, with that large parcel up on Parthenon um, Avenue, um, is uh, Centennial Park. Um, the properties on the south side of Parthenon Avenue are zoned RM40, um, and the surrounding properties have primarily uh, been developed with residential land uses. The proposed SP would permit a maximum of 10 multifamily units, um, excluding short-term rental properties. Um, the development would be regulated by the standards of the 31st Avenue and Long Boulevard UDO or Urban Design Overlay, um, which is applied um, today on the south side of Parthenon Avenue. Um, this UDO includes building standards um, with required setbacks, height, glazing amounts, massing, and material standards. Um, and so I hope you can see, but um, if not, so I highlighted um, the portion of the property to be rezoned is in red. Um, so that would be the SP boundary. Um, it comprises about a parcel and then another portion of a parcel. And I outlined that in green. Um, and that is currently owned by Metro Parks. Um, the adjacent property um, outlined in yellow um, that's between the uh, park to the northeast um, is owned by a uh, private property owner. Um, and so a feature of this SP um, would be to facilitate a land swap between the private property owner um, and Metro Parks in order for Metro Parks to have the private property portion, um, the, the site that's currently designated as private property, um, that would be transferred to Metro Parks and then the, the private property owner would um, have the portion of the property that's zoned SP um, and would, uh, it's, so the reason for a parcel and a half, I guess, is really to facilitate the same area being um, swapped, if that hopefully makes sense. If not, um, I'll be around for questions. Um, the policy on the site is uh, T5 Center open space, and that policy is really on the site today um, because it is Metro Parks property. Um, and so uh, with that, um, you know, we could look at a housekeeping amendment um, that would then change the policy on the property to the north um, after the land swap is completed, um, just to make sure that the conservation policy is tracking with um, property owned by Metro Parks. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at the policy, um, which as you learned from the last case is really what we use a lot of our rezonings on. But given that um, the, the rezoning would then facilitate the land swap um, is kind of how we're looking at it would enhance the center um, open space concept um, within this area and provide a contiguous policy there. Um, the adjacent uh, policy um, for that's shown in the purple area is urban neighborhood evolving, which is intended to provide high density residential, which is consistent with both the SP and what's currently been developed along Parthenon Avenue. Um, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. 
and is it fair to assume because the city and Councilman Taylor are the applicant that we are the applicant? So do we, or is there another applicant in the room? Councilman Taylor is the applicant. Okay, perfect. One other, one other question. Um, has Wait, hold on just a second. Has um, Metro Parks agreed to this land swap yet? They are in discussion with it, and that Metro Parks did sign the application as the, um, or wait, hold on. Councilmember Taylor uh, is the applicant. Metro Parks has been in discussion. Um, part, and Amelia, if you could go back to the slide with the policy. I think this is a helpful um, diagram to explain. You can see all of the green is owned by Parks. And then you see sort of these two little insertions. Those are privately owned. And so the idea is to sort of get all of the parks property on either end and the private development or and what's available for private development in the middle and so yes parks has been part of this conversation as well so parks this is on the parks board agenda for the november meeting after we act okay okay i will now open the public hearing up for discussion all those in favor if you please come up and state your name and your address, and you will each have two minutes. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm John Cooper with the Waller Law Firm, 511 Union Street, Suite 2700. I'm here uh, representing the owner of the property shown to the uh, north that's, that's, owned, that's directly next to the park. Um, Mr. Charlie Phillips, who's who's here and, and, and can speak after me, um, he and his company, Volunteer Builders, acquired that property for the purpose of, of developing it. Um, after that acquisition, we started having discussions with Parks, who, uh, I mean, understandably, don't want that parcel developed because it's basically in the middle of their parkland, and they wanted to try and keep the parcels that were for private development together. And so uh, we started talking about a, a maybe a pop property swap and they were willing to do that. Um, so that, you know, this has been going on for some time. Uh, Councilman Taylor, before the rezoning application was filed, did have a community meeting, I think it was on August 11th, where we presented this concept. Um, but this is a very unique opportunity. I haven't been involved in one uh, like this before. Uh, so Parks did sign or did submit a letter along with the application. So, um, I don't remember exactly what the language was, but it was in favor of the, the property swap and it is on the boards. That was at the staff level and it is on the Parks Board agenda coming up. So the proposed rezoning is to an SP, uh, and the SP density would be the same as RM40, which is all along the south side of Parthenon Avenue. It would also incorporate the UDO design standards that apply south of Parthenon, which are currently not on the property. Is that, that's all I get. <laughs> Thank you so much, Counselor. Anyone else here to speak in support? Sir, my name is Charlie Phillips, owner of the property we're in discussion. Um, just thank you for uh, seeing me. Just wanted to let you know that my late granddad was Randall Phillips, who started Phillips Builders here in Nashville, Tennessee in 1952. So my family and I, we grew up in Gillettsville, right up the road from you guys. Um, we were ready to go with five townhomes in this piece of property in approximately a month after closing. We were we were approached by Metro Parks, which was a first for me in my career. So um, having said that, I would very much uh, appreciate an opportunity to work with you guys in moving forward with this project. Um, I think it's a fair proposal for all parties considered and be welcome to ask and answer any questions while I'm here, uh, but that's really all I have to say. No, no short term rentals. <laughs> right. The property is the same size, so we're not getting anything bigger. That's a real big. I've never heard of a land swap. We, you know, I didn't, I've never been a part of one. And then the biggest thing is, is that um, we're here today because we're only asking for the zoning that every neighbor around that area already enjoys. We're looking for the same thing that they already have. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anybody in opposition? If so, please come on up, state your name and address, and you'll each have two minutes. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners, commissioner. Um, I'm here totally against this. I've lived in Parthenon Avenue with my husband for uh, 12 years. I commend Metro for the beauty, the jewel in the crown of Nashville, which is Parthenon, uh, the parks. I really do com commend all of you. But when it comes to Greenbelt, when it comes to trees and the beauty of the grass, and it is as it is, which has been there as long as I've been there and longer, I have a problem with this concrete jungle disappearing in Nashville. And I'm pretty shocked how it's changed dramatically, even in the last two years, which I'm sure we can all agree. But I don't understand why you want to take away precious land with all the huge development and the number of people that are moving to Nashville that are coming to that arena, which is a beautiful residential area, bearing in mind 12 years ago, I saw a lot of beautiful single houses with lovely big gardens. All that is gone. A large proportion of that is gone, and we have a concrete jungle. So it is fundamentally important that and I'm a small grain of sand in a beach. But it's fundamentally important, I would suggest, that Nashville keeps its green belt as much as it can. And I don't agree with taking away one house which is ramshackled and a disappointment to the community and replacing it with 10 houses. It does not make sense when you have that pocket of land is so breathtakingly beautiful, regardless of whether you've got a house either side of it. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Next. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is William Henry. I live at 3180 Parthenon Avenue. Uh, as the attorney said, you have a very unique opportunity here to save green space in Nashville. They're not making it anymore. Uh, I understand the developer moved, lives in Gillettsville where there's lots of green space. Develop something in Gillettsville and turn this over to Metro Parks, make this a very special part of Nashville from now on. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna save a neighborhood. We've got another 10 units proposed coming on the same street. Now he wants to put another five, stretch it if he can, and we're talking about destroying a street just so a person can make money building five units. You're not going to get this green space back. This is your final opportunity to, to preserve part of Nashville's heritage, do something really special for Metro Parks, do something special for the people in Nashville. If you look at the Google map of Nashville, there's no green space. I mean, two years from now, four years from now, y'all are going to entertain an idea to tear down the Parthenon and build, what, 10,000 units in Centennial Park just to raise tax revenue? Seriously? You know, please, with all due respect, um, this is a, a community property. It's not the, it doesn't belong to this developer. Uh, although he owns the private property, the city can write him a check. Metro Parks can have a beautiful parcel of land that is going to be something that all cities would, would be envious of. Okay? The long-term benefit of that far outweighs five units being built on Parthenon Avenue, some doing this little land swap to appease a developer, and somehow, you know, Metro Park is going to benefit. It's going to benefit greater if you take the whole parcel and give the whole thing to Metro Parks. So thank you very much for your time and your consideration. Thank you, sir. Next. Thank y'all so much for being here. My name is Alex Hosh. I live on Parthenon Avenue, 3163. I've been there for 
20 years. Um, I'm just kind of reiterating what William and my other neighbors have said. Um, I know the city spent a lot living right over there at Centennial Park redoing it, and thank you for that. It looks great, the different sections they've done as a whole, and I just don't understand if we're trying to redo green space, redo the park, why would we want to put more units right literally on the park? It seems like you would want to make it more user-friendly for everybody versus just a commercial transaction. Um, so, let's see. It's, uh, the council member said, uh, Trinity Lane was more walkable or getting to be more walkable. And it seems like there's a theme. The mayor, I hear on TV, he's wanting to make everything more pedestrian friendly. Hey, I'm a big walker, uh, a cyclist. I enjoy all that. And here we already have that, and we're wanting to move to make it different. I, I don't really understand that. I guess my last uh, thing is, and maybe I misunderstood, but he has a parcel of land and they were going to do a land swap and the middle land swap is a parcel and a half. Is that right? So he is, uh, I wasn't sure. Questions oh, during this time. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't know because he had one parcel and now he's getting a parcel and a half. So it just, it, it's just a real pretty area right on Centennial Park. Uh, and again, the whole theme that the mayor and everybody's talking about is a more walkable, cyclable, user-friendly space. We have one here, and now we want to change it into something that it's not. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. Next. Hello, uh, members. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is Benjamin Brown. I'm at 3140 Parthenon Avenue, which is located directly next to where they want to build the 10 units. Um, the main concern is 10 units is going to equal maybe 20 to 30 cars, um, kids, depending on how big they build them. Um, the streets. The street is already, like, really narrow, and there's a rear entrance to the um, to where they want to put the units at, I think we're going to be taking up more green space because you're going to have to put, what, maybe 30 feet worth of street maybe in the back so people can get in and out. Um, right now, it's actually, um, they tell they said to me, it's, excuse me, a private alley for uh, us to, you know, pave and keep maintain or whatever and so forth, but it's really narrow through there, so... The five unit space where he was, where he had, um, initially purchased, I'm thinking that that will take up less green space than the space that they want to turn over, plus the street that they're going to have to add. No one's saying anything about the uh, traffic. Also, visitors parking. The street is already crowded already. Um, when we do have events at the Parthenon, which um, a lot of people do park on the street, and that's you know acceptable, hanging out parties or whatever they're doing at the park, um, it's going to just add, Long Boulevard is more wide, but it's already crazy over there also, if you guys ever pass through there, it's crazy, people from out of town, they're driving extra fast, it's just a lot of uh, traffic over there. Um, neighbors work out in that particular area there, um, I was thinking, if you had the units spread out, maybe it's not so congested, making it look overcrowded. If he does his five units on his end, which that's what he initially um, purchased the property for, um, he has adequate alley space um, there to come in and come out. My time is up. Thank you so very much. Last but not least. Last but not least. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Chelsea Hansen, and I live at 3143A Parthenon, which is the bottom right corner of the screen. I live directly across the street from the proposed development site, and I have for the last nearly nine years. I live in a house whose basement leaks during downpours and recently had a sinkhole develop in the front yard. Um, I live in a neighborhood with the limited parking solutions and that suffers extremely from uh, soil degradation and water runoff during rain. There are no gutter systems. There are no, there's no water retainment system in place. 
So there's a huge concern over digging up a quarter acre parcel to develop 10 properties and where all of that excess runoff is going to go. So far in the last year, both dog parks have had to be reinforced because of runoff um, on the hills on the opposite side. But I also live in a district of 18,000 people that only has four parks. I live in a city ranked 86th last year out of the top 100 most populous cities in a nationwide assessment of, parking, of park systems. Our park system ranked 59th out of 100 in 2019 and dropped to 86th in two years. And I live across from a gem of the Nashville metro area, one that has been decades in the making and one that until recently I did not know was so fragile. The site was part of a multi, the site in question was part of a multi-unit purchase, parcel purchase by Metro Nashville in 1984. This plan to make this entire area park space has been decades in the making. The site was perched. Unfortunately, our existing infrastructure does not benefit from a land swap nor development project in excess of the current zoning restrictions. None of the properties south of Parthenon are, have developed in line with the zoning allotted. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> and we didn't agree whatever Brandon Taylor said. He never talked to us, none of us, and we agreed on this whole matter. You guys have a great evening. Thank you so much for coming. So usually in this particular situation, the applicant would have two minutes for a rebuttal. He's not here. Lisa, do you want to try to clarify anything that the neighbors asked relative to the size of the parcels and what the um, landowner can do on his existing one parcel. I think that's an important clarification. Certainly. Um, so the property, um, the the question about the size. So the property that is currently owned, the um, sort of northernmost property um, that's got the RM20 label on it, it is 0.26 acres in size. Um, the smallest of the. So you see where the red line is. The 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 smallest of the two properties is 0.17 and so the part of the property is to get to the 0.26 and so the land that's proposed to be rezoned is 0.26 acres the land currently owned is 0.26 acres um, it's a parcel and a part of a parcel just because there wasn't an exact parcel that was 0.26 acres so that is is why there's a parcel and a part included in the application um, the current the property that is currently zoned RM20 is permitted today to get an applicant to get a permit um, to build on the property actually without planning commission approval um, they could build um, five units um, and the, that would just be to go to codes to get an applicant to get go to codes get a building permit begin construction um, the we, Amelia talked during her presentation, the properties on the south side of Parthenon are within an urban design overlay, and so that does have some design standards that are not present on the north side on these two sort of uh, privately owned pieces that are interspersed within the park land, um, and so it wouldn't have the same design standards if they were to build under the RM20 as, as are located across the street. Um, the zoning is also different, RM40 on the south side, RM20 on this side. Um, anything else? Did I miss anything? I think that's fantastic. Thanks. All right. We will close the public hearing and start the discussion. Commissioner Henley, I'm going to start with you. Great. Well, first, I want to recognize the, the um, those who came and, and, and spoke in opposition. I'm, I'm well aware of some of our struggles with our with our park system, and you know, I think one of the things here, I think we should take into consideration, and uh, you know. Parks, as I understand it, Parks approached, um, you know, the, the applicant and facilitated this through the council member Taylor. Um, and, you know, our, our Parks Department does not have ample resources to just continue to make acquisitions. Um, and I know there are certain areas of town that they, we don't have the crown jewels that we have here. And so they have to be very um, litigious with how they utilize those resources. And, and honestly, they have to 
be creative in these ways to do what they feel is the best way to enable or preserve um, the functionality and the use of the parks. And with that said, I, I did have a question um, because we're, we're talking about this swap and, and there did seem to be an increase in intensity um, for that. But this is an SP and it's not a straight rezone to that increased intensity. So I think it, it may be helpful to at least articulate that there will be some elevated design requirements that go along with that versus what may have just been, as you as you um, explained, Lisa, just go to codes, pull permits. So I think that would be good to explain just a little bit. Certainly. Um, we, uh, planning felt like it was important to have the same level of design standards be applied to this property as have been applied on the south side of Parthenon. And so um, the applicant likely would have potentially just applied for RM40. Um, there was a desire on part of the council member to be able to restrict um, and not allow short-term rentals. The SP gave us the opportunity. There's a bit of a trade-off, a, a little bit more density, but higher um, design standards and density that's consistent with the south side of Parthenon, but also consistent with the design standards on the south side of Parthenon. Um, and so essentially we said the design standards of the EDO apply. Um, and so this would be reviewed again the same standards that are reviewed with this SP across the street. Thanks for that. And, and as I hear that, and what I wanted to just emphasize is, you know, it appears as though development would ensue, um, and and Parks is taking the steps that they felt able to and, and appropriate to create more cohesiveness on that on that street and on that corridor. And we at planning have been engaged, and we're taking the steps to ensure a more beneficial design and final product of what, you know, at least what's zoned there. And so with that being said, and I understand kind of the, the challenges that, that the neighbors face there, I think it got better than it would have been. Um, and, and understanding the, the, the present case is, is very important as we move forward in what we're talking about here today. So I'll listen to my fellow commissioners, but I just wanted to make sure that was clear for my behalf. Thank you. Commissioner Clifton. Those last comments, I think, were helpful to me. Um, it's uh, always um, a tough thing to think about when you hear people who have who've had to put up with an awful lot of change in their area already. Uh, and there's, I've been through there for many years, and it's certainly accelerated. <laughs> uh, so I don't blame them for being really reticent to just say, here we are. I think after, after listening to your extra comments and the, the staff's presentation, I think, I really do believe it won't be just better for the city to do this, but ultimately better than the only real option unless the city were to buy everything and they're probably not going to do all of that. So that's kind of where I am. Commissioner? You guys never said anything about the street. Um, you know, the traffic, the streets. We're talking about um, the green. Excuse me, sir. We, we've we've closed the public hearing. Excuse me, Commissioner Tibbs. I do think it's not a big deal. Excuse me, sir. I do, I'm not I'm not going to ask you again. The public hearing is closed. Okay, sir. I'm so let let us. We, speaking on those. We were respectful of you. Let us be respectful of our commissioners. Thank you so very much. I'm very respectful of all of you all. I just want you to know that, and I respect all of you. But you guys, I just didn't hear you guys speaking on some key things. No more, sir. Commissioner Tips. I do think it would be, you know, a kind of uh, Commissioner Clifton brought up. It would actually be wonderful if it was all, you know, the parks was able to have it all. But, you know, just based on the fact that they do not own that property, uh, I think that this solution is probably the best of, you know, better, so the best of you can do at this point. Uh, I think that if, you know, leaving it as it is, you know, the, the owner, the property owner has a rightful, you know, he, he can do the five units as, as Lisa brought up. And I think it would be better to have, if this land swap could happen, that it would, um, 
you know, it get, have some contiguous back to it. I think that that's, that's kind of where I am with it. I, I, like I said, it would be wonderful if the whole thing could be that way, but there are two properties that are owned by uh, public you know, private owners. So this is kind of probably the park's way of being able to keep some contiguous back to the, you know, the rest of the property that they own. Um, would we have to do some type of, um, what is it, um, uh, like, content, you know, what if parks change their mind? Do we have to do some kind of thing like that as part of it? Or, yeah, I think I'm that one of the so. conditions is condition. that the park board that has to condition? approve okay. this for this to be. Okay, I'm sorry connected. I missed that condition. But, yeah, that's, I mean, I understand the um, community. I, I, like I said, I agree. It would be nice if the whole thing was. But uh, just based off of the ownership that's happening right now, I think this is probably the best way to go. Councilman Withers. Uh, thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. I um, was trying to look through a few things. Uh, I think it's been established that we, we have a parcel today that is developable. Um, uh, this rezoning does relocate it adjacent to the other homeowner, which I can understand why that homeowner would be maybe not happy about that, would prefer to have it be a park. I understand that. Um, it looks like the number of units uh, would increase uh, with the rezoning of the SP, but it would be uh, versus the, con the current base zoning, but it would be consistent with, every, with the properties that are across the street. We are at that point talking about five houses units that would be added versus the base zoning. Um, and according to the staff analysis, I mean, this project isn't large enough to warrant a traffic impact study, but there are some estimates from staff about average daily trips, uh, and the staff analysis indicates or suggests that the uh, that would result in an AM peak of three additional trips uh, in, with this change and two for PM uh, in terms of um, PM peak changes. So that that is not zero, but it's not, uh, I think, overwhelming. Uh, I understand that there's quite a bit on the street already, but this is not, um, uh, even with RM40, it's a relatively intense zoning, but it's still a small parcel. So it's not that we're going to be adding 100 units to the street that, that, are, that are not already entitled. We're adding five. Um, I do think that having the uh, park space be more contiguous is better from a green standpoint, at least from the capacity of the city to address some of the stormwater mitigation. Having a little bit of a green space isn't really usable for parks and then another housing development. It's better to locate the, the housing adjacent to one another and then have the green space next to each other, that seems to be better from a, an environmental and water management standpoint as well. Um, so I, I understand the concerns that neighbors have, but again, when, when we look at the fact that this lot can be developed, um, there is a, a degree to which I would encourage neighbors to look at it from the city standpoint. If someone can go today and pull a building permit and we can convince them, if not to sell it to us or donate it to us, to at least work with us to do a land swap and even defer or hold off on their building permit while we try to work things out to make things as optimal as they can be for the community, that that is in the best interest of the community. So uh, I, I find that the benefits of the land swap that's proposed with uh, a little bit more density, but also with adding design guidance and limiting short-term rentals is a net positive for the community over what could happen in the existing entitlements. So thank you. Councilor Lady Allen. Um, thank you. I appreciate you having that, that picture up here, and I appreciate the folks that have come to speak on both sides. Um, I just am disturbed by the, the, the loose teeth, as it were, the missing teeth in, in that, and we still will end up with a missing tooth, even with this land swap, where that one green piece of land is next to the road. It, it, it seems to me that Metro Parks clearly had a long-term plan having bought up all the, I mean, you can see that they own the rest of it, to, to have that be part of that part of Centennial Park. Um, I, would, I would hope when Parks takes this up that y'all talk about the Centennial Park Master Plan and how this part fits into it. I'm, I'm looking at you, Commissioner. <laughs> um, and that's not necessarily what we're supposed to be doing, so now I will we'll turn to planning things. To be consistent with the conversation that we had on the last item, 
as I understand that this is not consistent with the open space policy. Um, and in the last one, we we felt like a, a compelling argument had been made in how the design that was proposed improved or moved things closer to that policy. Um, and I don't feel like that case has been made here. In fact, what's being proposed is an increase in density. Um, and, and, and that troubles me. Um, so I'm not sold yet. And, and then I would also ask, I mean, if, um, I mean, I agree it, it's, a, it's a problem to have five houses in the middle of, um, of the park. I have Commissioner Clifton, you'll remember this. Uh, I have a venue in the middle of, uh, of of the Dragon Park that was this funny thing that um, ended up there, and we've learned to live with it. So maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. I'm, I'm from a planning standpoint, I am confused why the necess why the land swap then made five units not good enough anymore. And so, if it's zoned RM20, and they were going to build five. Why are they now building 10? And does that does that enhance it? Does that give us a reason to do the end around on not being consistent with the policy? So I'm, I'm still a little skeptical. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, well, I guess if Lisa could speak to policy, that could be helpful. Sure. So for... Um, Typically, open space and civic policies, those are um, placed, uh, open space generally to recognize existing metro-owned properties, um, same that are parks, um, civic to recognize metro-owned properties that may be something other than a park. Um, for example, the our, our office complex is civic policy. And th so those are sort of recognition of the current ownership and use um, and so if there was the swap of the land there would sort of be the swap of the policy also because we would then have the the sort of northernmost piece of property is currently uh, not an open space policy but if it came under the ownership of Metro Parks it would need to become open space policy and so it would essentially be a policy swap along with the land swap if that makes sense. It is the, this is to Council Lady Allen's question, I guess, is the, I know that there's RM40, obviously, around the area. It, is the increase in intensity, is that meant to incentivize the land swap, or is it, is it strictly just to stay consistent with surrounding um, zoning? Uh, well, I think that the SP, which includes the increase in intensity, also includes the increase in design standards um, and the prohibition on short-term rentals um, that would not be present under the, the current zoning. And so I think those were considerations that the council member as the applicant was taking into um, consideration. So then we reviewed it as, as supplied. I got you. Um, I hear everything that um, Council Lady Allen says, and I think she raised some really good points. Um, I guess I'm left with if, if we disapprove, then the developer just builds five units in the middle of Park's property, which doesn't seem to be um, an ideal result. If we, if we did nothing, the developer can still build on the property that he owns, and you still have the Park's property on the other side of that. And so we're, we are unable at that point to make contiguous parks property. So it doesn't seem like disapproving it would be a win um, for the neighborhood or for the city. Um, speaking to the neighbor's concerns about like stormwater and drainage and soil degradation, I mean, it, I, I'm sure that actually would occur if any type of development would happen that would have to be addressed. But can you talk about just, I guess, what that, what addressing that looks like from Metro's perspective. <laughs> Certainly. So um, coverage permitted under RM20 would be similar to coverage permitted under RM40, lot coverage. And so the amount of building uh, permitted under RM40 is 
very similar to the amount of building permitted under RM20. Um, it's just the number of units that you sort of place within that, that bulk and mass. Um, and so stormwater, uh, Metro Stormwater review, would review um, if it came through under RM20, and I'm just going to probably, I'm just going to try to talk about the two different scenarios. If it came through under RM20, Metro Stormwater would be flagged when a building permit came in, um, and they would review it against the adopted stormwater regulations, um, which essentially require that you, um, that there be no more uh, water runoff after the development than, than before the development. So pre and post is, is sort of the, the language that we use. And so post development needs to be no more runoff than pre-development. Um, it would be the same for if there was an SP. Um, it would be reviewed at a different time. If there's an SP, we would require a final site plan, which is when the construction documents come in. Um, and so the construction documents would include those same standards. They would be reviewed against um, the adopted stormwater regulations. Um, again, the standards are the same pre and post, um, have to, you know, can't be in conflict with each other. So no more runoff after um, than before. That was, that was extremely helpful. Thanks, Lisa. Um, well, I guess I'm the, the last person here, so I can make a motion. So my motion would be to approve, approve staff's recommendation of approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. That is a proper motion. And we have a second. Is there any other discussion at this point in time? Councilor Lee Allen? Can I, can I just ask one question? Can you explain the process between going from the preliminary SP to the to the final SP? I mean, I don't see language here that, that has the conditions about park board's approval, and I don't see a condition here about a specific SP, including the UDO guidelines. When, when do those things get added as official part of this? They... They are, they are in there. Hold on just a second. Page 62. I'm looking at the staff report. Um, page 62 of the staff report. There's a, so this is a regulatory plan, but it includes a regulatory document that, that has those standards, and those standards would be, uh, that, that plan with the standards would be um, attached and become part of any ordinance. Of course, you all are making a recommendation to council. Any sort of rezoning is, is ultimately a, a council decision, um, but the, the plan that's the regulatory document includes those standards. Okay. Uh, speaking about the sort of going from a preliminary SP, which is this document, um, a preliminary, if, if passed by council, a preliminary SP is essentially um, setting up the entitlements, what would be permitted, uh, the number of units, the standards under that are followed. When a final site plan comes in, that's construction documents, and it would include any sort of um, stormwater plans, um, building elevations, um, building plans that would get reviewed then against all of those standards. Okay, thank you. Council, any other questions? I'm, I'm done with my questions. Thank you. Okay, we have a proper motion and a proper second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I did not vote. You didn't, you abstained. So we have four to one. Is that a, Alex, is that a? We have Commissioner seven. Clifton abstained. So Council Lady Allen voted no. We have four four yeses. You get to vote. You, you get to vote. I will vote yes. And as a point of clarification for everyone in the room, in a perfect world, if the Parks Department had unlimited dollars and we had a ready, willing, and able seller on lot 41 and lot 44, um, at, not at today's pricing. You're right, Council Lady. That would have been the perfect dream. But given that Lot 41 was owned privately and could build five houses, uh, I do think long term this is in the best interest of the parks and the best interest of the city. Um, even though it's going to cause some short-term angst with the neighborhood. All right, we are now on to item 34 the historic zoning. Not me. 
Uh, Mina's not here, so we will not have a report. Um, we're now on to item number 35, Parks Report. I will give you all a quick report. As you all know, Brookmead Park has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, I would tell you that from the Parks Department perspective, we clearly um, made some mistakes. I think the entire city made some mistakes to allow this to continue. Now with the mayor's new $50 million plan, um, we are committed to solving this quickly with all the department's help um, and making sure that this doesn't happen again. I think Council Lady Allen and Councilman Withers, what we both need once this is resolved is we're going to need more money to have more security for all of our parks to make sure this doesn't happen again. So as y'all go into your budget discussions next year, we're going to have to have more dollars allocated to security. That's the parks update. Uh, executive Mini, we don't have uh, Lucy or Greg or Jessica, so uh, we won't do that. Legislative update, Councilman Withers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I don't think I have anything for this body. Just want to uh, put out there for those who may be viewing uh, that the Metro Council is getting ready to take up our capital improvements budget requests. Um, Matt Wilkinson from the Council Office has sent out a list for each of the Council Districts. Encourage Council Members to take a look at it. Encourage constituents to reach out to your Council Member about that. Uh, and we are going to have a presentation from planning staff at our Planning and Zoning Committee on Monday. Just to review that process and hopefully we will get all those submissions in soon and then the planning commission will consider it later but just for anyone who is viewing please reach out to your council member and touch base about what is what is on the list or not uh, so that we can get everything evaluated by staff so thanks. great thank you so much seeing no other business i will accept a motion to adjourn so moved. we are adjourned been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.